The heart of this, I really took out a character quest. Not from what I heard from the platforms or even looking through their journals, which were meaningful, but what I gleaned from listening to the students as I watched them interact through the week. And I think we could all learn some leadership lessons from what I watched them practice. And I think there's some lessons that will be good for us as individuals, as Christ followers. I think there's some we can benefit from as parents and as families. And I think there's some ways we can benefit as a community of faith. And I wanna begin with just a simple idea, but I think it's very important in this season. I think we're getting a little bit of tragedy fatigue. Do you feel like that? You know, I'm like, just enough already. You know, go home and, and shelter in place. Two million of you are going to die and open borders and economic stuff and chaos and disinformation and propaganda and manipulation and violence here and violence there and ungodliness. And I'm confused about how I was born. <sighs> And I interact with Christians these days across the country. I did an interview yesterday with, uh, in Philadelphia, and they said, how do you avoid discouragement? And it's really where I'd like to start. And what I wanna submit is that it, it isn't that complicated. I, would, I think we have to just refuse to be discouraged. There are some discouraging things happening. I mean, if you look at them and you focus on them and you take them to heart and you meditate on them, they will rob you of your joy and your hope and, your, and you, you just try to avoid it. But that's really not the best answer. And I think we have to begin with this notion that I, I will not be discouraged. I'm going to ask you to think of discouragement as an unwanted guest, a visitor, a person without a body. Don't think of it as some inanimate object or an emotion. I want you to think of it as a person. I think it's a spirit. And you need a plan for how to deal with it. And we, we can begin with this notion that it is not welcome. And that if you'll make that decision, it can diminish the impact of discouragement on your life. Discouragement will visit every one of us. But we can make the decision that it's not a welcome visitor. You can't stay here. I'm not going to entertain you. I'm not going to listen to the reasons you're bringing me to be discouraged. You know, our children's spaces around campus are secure places. They're not open to the general public. You're not welcome just to walk through the nursery. If you have a baby and you're taking them to the nursery, we'll ask you to check in, register your child and yourself, and we will give you a tag unique to every visit. And there are people standing there checking your tag. If you get into the nursery without a tag or a child, you come tell me. I mean, I tried to get into one of the, I had some guests tonight. I was showing into one of the spaces where there were teenagers and they gave me grief. <laughs> Somebody on our staff last week had a child that was participating in character question. At the end of the day, the parents pick up the kids and they have to have the tag. The staff person was picking up their child and another staff person was working the door and would not release the child. <laughs> I'm still picking on them about that. So I'm suggesting you take that mentality with your heart. See, we're really sloppy. Well, today I just kind of feel kind of blue. No. Today I feel like I'm going to worship the Lord. Today I think I'll break out my Bible and read the Psalms till the joy of the Lord overtakes the heaviness that settled on me when I woke up today. You're not welcome here. Or the Fed rate raised rates again, and it's going to impact this, or it's going to, okay, so the economy's in a little bit of turmoil. I'm confident heaven's not in a panic. The streets are paved with gold. Just scrape off the top layer and share. We're going to be good. <laughs> Repave. We do it around here frequently enough. Establish in your heart, you don't have to be discouraged. Well, life's hard. Okay. I agree, it can be much harder than we would like it to be. Circumstances, relationships, diagnosis, age, weather, whatever. It's harder than we want it to be. I'll even sit next to you and cry a bit. Sometimes it's painful enough and you can sit next to me, we can have a little cry, then we're gonna get up and go, but I'm not giving in to it. My Bible says, guard your heart above all else. 
We've been really casual with it. Do you think they had a poll on D-Day? How many of you young people feel really courageous today? Statistically, more than half of you probably will not survive. Does anybody feel blue? If you feel blue, just stay home. I don't think so. Well, what are we? What are we, do we think we're gonna make a difference in this generation for the kingdom of God against all the forces of darkness without there being a counterattack? And the primary battlefield is going to be in your thoughts and your emotions. So we're gonna to have to say to discouragement, <laughs> nice try. Not today. First Chronicles 28, David said to Solomon, his son, David, greatest king in Israelite history, to Solomon, his son, who has secured the throne. Powerful power, an ancient Near Eastern monarch. There is no court of appeal, total authority. David's counsel to him is be strong and courageous. Well, what's he have to be courageous about it? What's gonna discourage him? He's the king, he can take your land, he can take your daughter. Be strong and courageous and do the work. There's work to be done and you're going to need strength and courage to do it. Do not be afraid or discouraged. If David's telling him not to be afraid and discouraged, what's the battle? He's frightened and discouraged. There are other rivals to the throne. There's a constant churn in the monarchies. The reason they had cupbearers and taste testers is the most frequent way of disposing of them was poison. Don't be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God is with you and he will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. He's telling him not to be discouraged or frightened for building the temple. Do you have room to imagine that doing something God called you to do, God wanted you to do, God's made provision for you to do, could still be met with a response internally of fear and discouragement? Well, I thought the Lord had called me, but now I don't know, I'm so frightened and I just feel so heavy and so discouraged and this is more difficult than I want. Yeah! So I I decided, you know, I was going to lose a little weight. I want to get a little more cardiovascular fitness. So I, I signed up for the gym. I got a personal trainer. I went. It was awful. I got in there. I felt bad. I didn't do very well. Everything hurt. I just got out of there with my life, and I'm two days later, and it's worse. Now everything really hurts. I'm never going back there. Yeah. It's called getting stronger. Second Chronicles 20. There's an overwhelming army, an army that cannot be defeated. Israel does not have the military might nor the technical superiority to defeat the army that has besieged them. And the king's name is so long, he had to be 16 before he could spell it. I mean, it's not easy. King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. You know why the Lord's saying that? Because they're terrified out of their mind. Because of this vast army, the battle is not yours, but it's God's. If you're not living in a place where you're conscious that the part of the battle in front of you is not yours, it's God's, you need to change places. Because we've been called to serve the Lord. The Lord doesn't serve us, we serve him. I want there to be places in my life where if God isn't engaged and God isn't participating, the outcome's not gonna be great. It's beyond me, it's, it's beyond my ability, beyond my intellect, beyond my experience, beyond my contact list, beyond my resources that are available. I wanna be engaged with the Lord in such a way that his participation is essential for a good outcome. And if you make that choice for yourself, you're going to have to guard your heart because discouragement and fear will come to visit. And you go, oh, I've been waiting for you. You passed by here last month. I remember. Well, let me read you what the Lord has said. He said the battle's not mine, it's his. You better pack up, he's coming for you. 
Before we leave this session, I'm, we're going to read a psalm together about what God said he will do to our enemies. But the beginning point for us is to say discouragement, uh -uh. not here, not today. And I'm going to worship the Lord until you, you leave. The devil hates it when you worship the Lord. And I'll tell you the truth, the darkest days in my life, the, the most difficult, challenging days, I didn't have the emotional strength. To, to, to do what I'm telling you with the enthusiasm that you see. But I have, I have been able to sit down and I would start with the character of God. And I would say, God, I know you're a faithful God. I know you're a faithful God. And I know you're a loving God. And I, I know you're a just God. And I know you're a merciful God. And I know you're a God of grace and a God of power. And I would stay with the character of God because that's not, that doesn't matter about how I feel or whether I'm good or bad or whether I've got strength or I don't have strength or I have a solution. I'm going to stay as close to who God is as I know how to stay. God, this is what I know about you. And I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm not moving. I'm not going anywhere. And I would stay with that until that heaviness would begin to, I won't tell you it would just evaporate and I'd be filled with this overwhelming joy, but I would find enough strength to, to take another day. You, you got to decide that you will not yield to that. And, and the, the cousin to discouragement is disappointment. Well, you know, I didn't think I'd be in this place. I didn't think at this point in time or in this season of my life or I didn't think this summer or I really this summer I wanted to or I thought by the time I finished that class or I thought, no, no, I will worship you. I will worship you. You're good to me and merciful to me and gracious to me. And I'll give praise and honor and glory. I'll not be discouraged. I will not yield to disappointment. God is at work on my behalf. In the places I can't see him, in the circumstances I don't understand, in the challenges that are before me, God is at work at my behalf. And I'll give glory to him and praise to him and honor to him. Well, this isn't the way I wanted. I wanted him to heal me supernaturally. Okay, I'm, I appreciate that. That's a legitimate desire. Sometimes he heals us in different ways. I didn't want to have to work overtime. I wanted to win the lottery. I didn't want to have children that were strong-willed. I wanted compliant, God-honoring children that leapt out of bed in the morning and say, how might I serve you today, parents? And God gave me the spawn of <laughs> Lord, I will worship you. I'll give glory to you and honor to you and praise to you. I, I can tell you, st I'm still working on that. I still fall prey to that. How I want God to move. And when he doesn't do it my way, I, I'm tempted to want to withdraw or give in to discouragement or, or disappointment. I have to guard my heart. No, no, no. I don't want to. Yeah. I've told you the story before, but it's on point. When I was in college and I made the decision that I would do ministry. If the Lord asked me, I didn't know what that meant. I certainly didn't want to be a pastor and nobody wanted me to be. <laughs> but I, I changed my academic career. I only had three semesters left and I needed to get a degree on time or I was going to be out of resources. And so I did all of that and I said, Lord, I don't know what that means, but I'll serve you somehow. I'll do what you want me to do. For me, it was, a, it, it was all the courage I had. I didn't have the courage to say I'd go into the ministry. I just said, you know, I'll serve you. And I won't go, because I had a plan to be independent. And, <laughs> and not too long after that, I was on a Friday afternoon, I crushed my face playing in the snow. And I went to the hospital and they said I needed immediate surgery, that there was, could be nerve damage and the sooner the better and all this stuff. It wasn't a good, very good diagnosis. 
And I was frustrated. I was mad at God. And I said, no, I've made a decision. I've reoriented my entire life and I'm going to serve the Lord. And if God won't heal me, I won't serve him. And I checked myself out of the hospital. Can you say pride? <laughs> and I checked into a, a hotel for the weekend. I didn't want to go back to the dorm. And I spent the weekend with my Bible open and talking to the Lord. And by Monday morning, through some wise counsel and some people who let me vent, and mostly my parents. By Monday morning, I understood that if God wanted to heal me through the skill of a physician or he wanted to heal me supernaturally, it was not my decision. That I had to trust him to be the, my healer. And with a great deal more humility than I had had on Friday afternoon, I called the doctor back and I said, if I were to show up at the hospital, could I get back on your rotation? And it was a, the, a, the first episode in a lesson I'm still learning that we don't dictate to God how he brings our deliverance. There's a God and it's not us. It's not up to me. My decision is to honor the Lord. My decision is to guard my heart and my mind. My decision is to give the joy of the Lord first place. So I would submit to you in the midst of all the turmoil, and there's a lot of it, unprecedented amounts of evil and ungodliness and wickedness. We're going to begin by saying to discouragement and disappointment, no, you're not welcome here. You may visit here. And then there may be circumstances that give you entree here, but it's going to be a very short visit because every time I'm aware of your presence, I'm going to begin to worship the Lord. Why do we have to go? I don't know. I don't know. Why didn't God part the Red Sea before Moses and the Israelites got there? Well, they would have missed out on a lot of lessons. They'd have missed out on a lot of courage that got tucked into their hearts. They would have missed a lot. See, I don't ever want a problem. I don't ever want a deliverance because I don't ever even want to know I have a problem. But the only strength you get is from working against resistance. And they say, well, I don't really want to be strong. I just want to be happy. I don't want to be strong. No. I mean, I think if you gave us a choice, most of us wouldn't go get in the line. How many of you like to have huge spiritual muscles? No, I'm good, really. <laughs> Just won't go to heaven. And the Lord says, but I need my church to be strong in the earth. And he begins to call us and put us in places to mature and grow up and go, whoa, whoa, big fella. Couldn't pastor just get more mature? We have to say no. We've got to learn to follow the lamb completely and totally with our whole heart. It's an image that is used so frequently in the book of Revelation. In fact, the book of Revelation can be understood as a conflict between the lamb and the beast, between the true Christ and the false Christ. And the message or the outcome in the book of Revelation is triumphant for those who follow the lamb. And there's this unique phrase that's used a couple times. And I just want to tag it. It's Revelation 7, 17. It says, the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will lead them to springs of living water. If you will follow the Lord, he will lead you to springs of living water. He may choose some paths that you didn't anticipate. He may have more confidence in you than you have in yourself, but he will lead you to springs of living water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. That phrase is used again in Revelation 21, very near the end of the story, right before the end of this age and a, a new heaven and a new earth. And it says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And I was thinking about those passages and, and praying through them. And the question that was in my heart is, what's the cause of the tears? Because you can look in Revelation and there's some pretty intense suffering. Big chunks of humanity come under the judgment of God and there's suffering of the saints. You know, I know most Christians like to read Revelation and think, well, that's not about me. I won't be here. Well, some saints will be here. And I don't think we have enough precision in our understanding of the story to not pay attention. So what is the source of those tears? And it could be pain or suffering or disappointment. And that's a legitimate interpretation. I'm not saying that's evil. But that wouldn't be my first choice. That's not my first understanding of it. And in Revelation 5, there's a scroll in heaven that has the key to this, this unfolding vision, but there is no one that is worthy to open the scroll. And John begins to weep. 
because there's no one worthy. It's a fascinating passage. It's Revelation 5. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. How often do we weep because the presence of God is inadequate? Then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he turns to see the lion of the tribe of Judah, it looks like a lamb who's been slain from the foundation of the world. It's our Lord. And as I read that and meditated on it, I felt like, at least for me, whether the Lord was, you know, when we see the Lord in his glory, in all of his majesty, I believe we will weep. And I think one of the things we will weep for is those times we've been so reluctant to cooperate with him. Because when we truly see him in all of his glory, in all of his splendor, you know, with the word of his mouth, all of the dead will come to life. I've been thinking about that for a few weeks now. With just the word of his mouth, all of the dead. How could he do that? Because he defeated death. All he needs is the word of his mouth and death is like, well, we got no hold over you. That's our boss. And we will see him one day in all of his splendor and all of his glory and all of his majesty. And I think when that is so clear to us, there'll be tears. Lord, I was so reluctant to believe you. You put invitations in front of me and I didn't want to participate. I didn't want to yield. I didn't want to cooperate. I was so stubborn. I wanted my way. Oh, Lord, I didn't understand. I didn't understand your, your glory and your majesty and your power. I'm so sorry. Well, then I go back and read those verses where he'll wipe every tear away. And he said, there'll be no more crying. There'll be no more mourning. There'll be no more death. Uh-uh. Death's been defeated. See, we still live in the middle of the conflict. And the condition and the attitude of our heart is so important. Our king is triumphant. He is triumphant. Revelation 19 says, I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and makes war. And his eyes are like blazing fire. And on his head are many crowns. Folks, you're going to see Jesus one day, not in a stable, not in a manger, not with a bunch of fishermen that can't figure out how much bread to bring, not with a group of people that deny him when the pressure comes on. You're going to see him with an innumerable company of angels and many crowns and all the glory of heaven and the splendor of almighty God. And we'll call him Lord. Yeah. We're just warming up. We're just warming up. Well, today was hard. Yeah, I know it was. Did I mention we're just warming up? If the enemy is game planning against you, stand straighter. You know, I liked competitive sports. I don't play them as much anymore for some obvious reasons. <laughs> you know, a hundred years ago, I played at Riverdale. I was not a great athlete. I was just mean. That's true. I'd learn the game plan and then be the meanest one on the court. Well, I mean, if you're not a great athlete, you've got to find some advantage. And I, I can tell you with some authority, I don't believe any opposing team ever had to have a game plan for me. Other than we hope they've got three more just like him. But there were some people on my team that if you played us, you had to have a way to, to limit their effectiveness or they would beat you. Make a decision in your heart to serve the Lord with such abandon, such enthusiasm, such determination, such focus, such discipline, such commitment that the adversary will have to have a plan for you. Amen. 
Now, I want to take the minutes we've got left and share with you some, some of my observations from camp. As I walked around campus last week and listened to the kids and, and watched what was happening and interacted with the parents, there were some things that to me were very much a part of that camp experience, but also seemed to be very much a part of our community experience as we grow and lead in our faith. We're going to have to lead with our faith. Leading from behind is nonsense. That's another day. And one thing I observed was this dynamic and the tension that exists between old friends and new friends. We like our old friends better because the new faces really aren't friends. We just call them friends because this is the South and we're too polite to say, I don't want to know you. <laughs> so we'll look at them and smile and then we'll think, how long do I have to talk to you before I can go talk to my real friends? And there's a tension that exists in us between new friends and old friends. It's not a new thing. It's a very biblical thing. I could have brought, we, could have, we could spend weeks on this list, but we're going to do it pretty quickly. But in Acts chapter 10, um, Peter has gone to Caesarea. And the events of Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost have been duplicated. There's one very significant difference. In Acts chapter 2, it's Peter and James and John and the Marys and the crew that were close to Jesus. They've been waiting in the upper room where Jesus told them to wait until the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. It's an inner circle. It's Jesus' closest followers and friends. And they have this supernatural experience that, that really ignites the Jesus story going viral in Jerusalem and the surrounding regions. And, and, and they find a new boldness that comes with them to them with the presence of the Holy Spirit. They're transformed by it. These people who have cowered in fear and been slow to catch on are now willing to stand in the public square and become unrepentant advocates for Jesus. And thousands of people are responding. It's the most dramatic thing. And they link it back because they wrote the story. They link it back to the events in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And they link that to Acts chapter 1 as a fulfillment of what Jesus told them to wait for. So it's Jesus' closest friends following the instructions they got privately from him. We read about that in John 15, 16, 17. It's fulfilled in Acts 1 and 2. And so the inner circle, they are rocking and rolling. Things are good. Jerusalem is awakening to the true Messiah. The, the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders are becoming jealous. The, the surrounding villages, the, the supernatural. Peter's shadow is bringing healing to sick people. And then we get to Acts chapter 10. And the events of Acts chapter 2 are duplicated in the house of a Roman soldier that is filled with pagans. Now they have no precedent for this. Remember what Jesus said to the, to the non-Jewish woman that came to him and said, my child needs your help? He said, I didn't call, it's not right to give the bread for the children to the dogs. There's no cultural spin on that that makes that more comfortable. And now the events of Acts chapter 2, the things that has made them unique, the fulfillment of the promises, the Romans? The Romans? Really? It's in your notes. It's Acts 10, 45. The circumcised believers, that's kind of code for the Jewish believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on them. For they heard them speaking in tongues and glorifying God. New friends. Now we like their old friends better. This, this new friends, old friends, is a persistent challenge for the balance of the New Testament. And it's a challenge today. It is so tempting to huddle with familiar faces and to avoid the new ones. We're more comfortable. You know, what's the expression? Better to be with the devil you know than the one you don't. You already know the weaknesses and the strengths of the ones you know. Why risk new ones? Outside forces can disrupt opportunities after all. I'll tell you where I heard it at camp. More than one parent reaching out with whatever best channel they could identify 
if they had any personal access to somebody that had access to something, can you put my child in this group? That's where their friends are. Because I don't want my child to have to go to a group where they don't have their friends. Because I know there's four or five kids there that are good, but the rest of those little urchins. <laughs> and it's not usually like just a friendly call. It's not like a call, you know, it'd be okay if... Like, I can't think of a single call ever where somebody called and said, could you put my child in a group of people where they don't know any of them? <laughs> you know, one of my takeaways from camp, and this was more inside of me, it wasn't something I heard, but, but the real objective of the, that effort with those young people is to make godly adults. I know they're not quite there yet, but we're trying to come alongside those parents and help those young people form character and emotional maturity and spiritual maturity so that they can be godly adults. And if I could be so bold, I would submit a pretty helpful component of that would be, you got a week with a safe group of kids and you're gonna have some friends in the mix, but what if you met some new ones? Amen. Well, but they would rather be with their friends and they don't wanna go if they can't. They couldn't have learned that from us. Because it's not like we like to sit in the same place every week. Because we know the people who sit there and we like those people. And those people over there, we're not even sure they're Christians. Now we know there's an anointing amongst us, right? Let me just look at these people. They're so anointed and godly and special and spiritual. But have you all looked at yourselves lately in the mirror over here? I don't know how, I didn't get pulled in. I don't get those calls directly. I mean, they'll reach out. To, if they get to me, they are really desperate parents. You can hear the helicopter up above. Like, Whoa. We're, build, we're doing camp to build character, but we don't want our kids to have any stress. And I thought, well, wait a minute. That's us. That's us. You want me to go to church on Wednesday night? I don't go to church on Wednesday night. God goes to church on Sunday morning. New friends and new faces. But I like my small group. We know one another. We get along with one another. We have such a good time. It just feels good. We enjoy being together. Well, good. Let's call out a weekly party, a dinner club. But let's not call it faith-based or Christ-centered or ministry-oriented. <laughs> Have I offended everyone yet? I'm working on it. But I mean, I like to be with people who are my age, experience the things I'm experiencing this season of my life. I have to be with younger couples. I got kids that cry. <laughs> or I like to be with people that are my age that understand technology. I have to be with old people. They creak and pop and they want to be home asleep by 7.30. I mean, after all, it, I want to be in a group with my friends. <laughs> Leadership. We want to make an impact for the kingdom of God. We want to change our world. We want to see Jesus welcomed into the public square and the corporate setting honor our faith with the same boldness that they honor ungodliness. But can't I be in a group with my friends? Even the Gentiles got it. Peter goes back to Jerusalem. He has a harder time telling what happened when he gets to Jerusalem than he did experiencing what God did in Caesarea. We may have to make an adjustment, folks. Let your kids make some new friends. Yeah, but it's gonna make it harder to get them to go to camp. Yeah, it probably will. But it'll make camp more meaningful when it's said and done. If they're not, when are we gonna learn that? Don't make me deal with them when they're 40. Because if you've coddled them all the way through those developmental years, you're almost impossible at 40. I got to go, don't I? <laughs> Courage. 
1 Corinthians 6, 13, we've talked about this already. Be on your guard and stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Church, we're going to have to be people of a different kind of courage. This isn't about comfort and convenience and ease. Who told us that? Who told us that? God is stirring us. You're, we're making great strides. We do church outdoors, indoors. We change. We have it on Wednesday night. We're learning a lot of lessons, but underneath it all is we're going to have to be people of courage and be strong. There's new challenges. I spent a week watching the kids do this. We're going to put you 30 feet in the air and make you walk across a metal cable. You're going to do what? I don't feel really good. You have to do it. Or they get them up in the air and they'll say, I can't go any farther. Well, we won't bring you down. God's got some of us 30 feet in the air. It takes some courage to do this. The whole camp's outdoors. It's not comfortable. It rained one day. It was muddy one day. It's a whole lot better than it's been this week. Hallelujah. <laughs> but you know, hot and wet is part of it. It's summertime. We had a first aid tent. Kids came to the camp. The grass scratched me. <laughs> it will do that. Yes, it will. Come over. Let me give you a hug. It's coming. Look, I think it's okay. It's survivable. No arterial bleeding. We do that a little bit. Well, I got there in the sanctuary where I wanted to sit was full. I just couldn't worship the Lord. Those songs they sang, I just couldn't. We need like a first aid tent. Oh, come here. You got a grass scrape. <laughs> Courage, folks. We can laugh a little bit because we, it, it's, it's, yeah. we got a challenge in front of us. We've got some lifting to do. New friends, new faces, courage. We're going to need some encouragement. Hebrews 10, 25, let us not give up meeting together. All of you on the other side of the red light. I know some of you can't be here, but you need a body of believers. You need God's people. Let us not give up meeting together as some of you are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Look, I'll tell you what I observed. Everybody does better with encouragement. Everybody does. Just everybody does better with a little bit of encouragement. But to be an encourager is a learned behavior. One of the things around I observed last week with the students or the campers was when they're doing those elements and high things and trying to, you know, that, that when, they're, when they're participating, there, there's, there's, there's somebody saying to them, you're doing a good job. And on more than one occasion, I watch somebody like come down the climbing wall and they'd be unhooking their harness and somebody else is still going up and, and they'd turn to go away. They're kind of full of their accomplishment. And I would hear somebody say to them, encourage the one on the wall. I watched them train one another. And some of them had more of a natural affinity for it. Some of them are more introverted. Some of them are more aware of others. I mean, we're all different points of growth and development. But the Bible tells us to encourage one another. To be an encourager is learned. What if you decide that every day you're going to find three people intentionally and say or do something that's encouraging? I mean, you pick your number, pick your routine, but, but do it on purpose. If you don't do it on purpose, you probably won't do it. To be an encourager is a choice. It's like saying thank you. If you've been around parents who are trying to teach some little people to say thank you. It will wear the love of Jesus out of you if you've already learned that, right? What do you say? Thank you. 30 seconds later, what do you say? Thank you. You know, before long, I'm like, leave them alone. Thank you for them. 
But they're trying to instill something in those hearts to make an impression or an imprint. And, and being an encourager is not easy. It doesn't come naturally to us. The, the church is not traditionally known as an encouraging place. In fact, what we're known to do is patrol the battlefields and to finish off our wounded. The last place you want to be vulnerable typically is in the group of, amidst a group of Christians. I mean, isn't the, I mean, I'm not saying it's right, but isn't kind of the traditional image? If you want to go spill your brokenness, you go to the bar and do that. But you wouldn't do that in a bunch of Christians. To be an encourager takes the focus away from ourselves. Well, we need that. The kids needed that. I watched one, I watched two young people, two young women climb the climbing wall. And one of them did it with just, just like raw athletic abilities, like a bug going up the wall. And the other one did it with just strength. An unusually strong young person. I, watched, I mean, she just like overpowered the obstacle. And they did it with different routes and different styles, but they both did it. And when they got down and they were unhooking and one of them was turning away and I heard a parent say, cheer for the next one. And I thought, ah, oh, if we could just learn that with the big people. Cheer for the next one. Cheer for the next one. Old friends, new friends, courage, encouragement. We're under authority. Ah, oh. we're not the boss. We may have assignments and realms of authority and things for which we will be held accountable, but ultimately it's not ours. We're praying that his kingdom come and his will be done. Those were our instructions. And then I spend most of my life trying to figure out how to get him to do my will. Does it, how much of our angst with the Lord comes because he's not doing what I want him to do. All right? I mean, I know what I want God to do and I know pretty much the timeline I want him to do it on. <laughs> Excuse me. Luke 7. Jesus has an encounter with a Roman soldier. <clears throat> who needs his help. And Jesus agrees to help him. It's, it's really an inexplicable circumstance. The Jewish leaders intercede for the man. They say, he's a good man. He helps our community. So even though he's a Roman soldier, will you help him? And Jesus is doing that. And the man comes to meet Jesus. And he said, don't trouble yourself. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. You know the story. I don't even consider myself worthy to come to you. Do you understand the power difference in these two? The Roman soldier has the power, the political power, the physical power, the legal power. Jesus is an occupier, occupied. I mean, he has some power we know about because of who we know him to be. But in the social system, the, the, the soldier has all the juice. And he says in public, you understand how vulnerable he's making himself with all of those that he is exercising authority over? He's going to say to one of the hated people that you're domineering, he's going to say, I wasn't worthy to have you come under my roof. Remarkable, remarkable man. And he said, I have some authority. I can command soldiers and I can command. But he said, you have the authority to command sickness and disease. How did he know that? Was he on the periphery when Jesus did the Sermon on the Mount? I don't, we don't know. There's no details given. But he said, I recognize in you an authority. And here's the part that is amazing. It, it's it's mind-blowing if we can get it. He is humbling himself before Jesus. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. I will yield to your authority. I didn't bring you to my house at the point of a spear. I didn't bring you under threat of incarceration. You say the word, and my servant's okay. Under authority. And it says that Jesus was astonished. He marveled. He said, I haven't found anybody like this in all of Israel. Who is this man? And it made everybody mad. Goofy rabbi. This guy didn't even eat the right foods. Didn't even know how to dress. Doesn't come to synagogue. Who are you to tell us? 
Jesus is trying to tell us something under authority. I saw it with the kids. Rules cause us to chafe. They do the simplest rules. I'll talk, what'd you do today? What was your favorite part of camp today? I didn't get to do the zip line. Well, it wasn't like we singled you out. I said, oh, look, there's Jane. Whatever you do, don't let her do the zip line. Torture her today. Make everybody else do the zip line, not her. Well, there were schedules built and routines put in place and everybody didn't get to do everything on the same day. And some days that wasn't fun because that looked like fun and I wanted to go do that. And, and a part of growing through camp was saying, yeah, I'm kind of under that and my group didn't do that today. We chafe at authority, folks. We have trouble just parking in the parking lot between the lines. I'm not talking about heavy duty stuff. I'm not talking about sexual anymore. I'm just talking, we have a hard time parking in the parking lot between the lines. We'll go park on a curb illegally. It's closer to the building. <laughs> then we'll come inside and ask the Lord to bless us. Does that sound like church? You see, it's just the principle of yielding to authority. It's not easy to us. Someone else made the plan. It's a stupid plan. I don't like it. Me too. I traveled. We traveled some last month doing pastors' conferences. We got home one um, one Thursday night about midnight, and I made the boneheaded comment at the airport: "At least there won't be any traffic." <laughs> and you know what happened? There was construction on I twenty four. So I've been doing pastor's conferences and traveling from city to city, and now we're sitting on I-24 after midnight, backed up for so far, I can't even see the, the solution. And we get to the traffic, to the pinch point where the major construction is underway. And there were three people. <laughs> two of whom were obviously coaching the one who was working. And I've been parked on I-24 for about 45 minutes. And I, it's safe to say that when I went past them, there was nothing on the inside of me that qualified me to do a pastor's conference. <laughs> Someone had made a plan and they didn't consult me. And I could help them with the inadequacy of their planning. And if I'd have had the governor's number. <laughs> you know, here's the, the, the real truth is you and I are under spiritual authority all the time. The question is which spirit? And to say that you're born again and you're always under the authority of the Holy Spirit really misses the point. We'll, we'll all get our mind right when we're getting to do what we want, when we want, the way we want. The challenge is, are we willing to be under authority when it requires us to humble ourselves and maybe be viewed by people around us whose approval we care about as if somehow we're making a choice that they don't understand? Under authority. I'll tell you what that sounds like when it comes out of me. Well, this isn't how I thought my life would unfold. See, being under the, the, the authority of Jesus is really about lessons in trust and redemption. My time's up. Old friends, new friends, courage, encouragement, under authority, help one another. You can't be on the ropes courses. You can't do any of those elements unless there's somebody on the ground attached to you. Somebody has to belay you. It was a part of the lesson for every student, every event, all week long, before they could start the activity that they were looking forward to, they had to find a peer that was saying to them, I'm ready for you to go. What if we stood with one another like that? What if we helped one another like that? See, I can kind of mildly poke some fun at the parents that want to intervene to take all the obstacles away from their kids while they're at obstacle camp. because it's so similar to who we are. We want to be strong in you, but I don't want any obstacles. 
We have to help one another. There is such power in serving. The people that take the most away from that camp, I promise you, are the, the adults who come serve. And I think there's some amazing things that happen for the students and the campers, but the ones who get the biggest benefit are the adults who come. On Friday morning, they have a, a quiet time, a reflective time. I'm done with this. And they spend about an hour and they're washing, the, the, the counselors are washing students' feet and the campers are washing one another's feet. And if you look around the periphery, there's all these adults. And the kids are pretty intense, you know, they're, they're lining. But I walk around that periphery and I'm, I'm praying just for the kids quietly and, and adult after adult's got tears running down their cheeks. Old, hard, crusty, grumpy, cranky camp counselors. And the Lord's touching our hearts. We need the Lord to touch our hearts. We need some leadership from the church again. We've been acting like the world. I promised you a psalm with some angel stories. It's Psalm 35. I want us to close with this proclamation. We're just going to read it together. But I want you to hear what David is praying will happen to the people that oppose the purposes of God. Why don't we stand for this? You ready? Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take up shield and buckler. Arise and come to my aid. Brandish spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. May those who seek my life be disgraced and put to shame. May those who plot my ruin be turned back in dismay. May they be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. May their path be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Hang on just a moment. How's that for a prayer? <laughs> May the path of my enemy be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. That's not like an easy camp. Verse seven, since they hid their net for me without cause, and without cause dug a pit for me. May ruin overtake them by surprise. May the net they hid entangle them. May they fall into the pit to their ruin. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight in his salvation. My whole being will exclaim, who is like you, O Lord? You rescue the poor from those too strong for them, the poor and the needy from those who rob them. Amen, that's a great prayer. God bless you. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you wanna be notified when there's new content and we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.